Thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church. Listen as Pastor Steve Smart brings the message of hope in Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, let's take them out and turn to John 19. John 19, as Andrew uh, introduced this morning, John 19. We're going to read through the first 18 verses of this text as we continue where we left off last week. Last week, we left off, of course, at the end of chapter 18. Uh, Jesus, let me just kind of catch you up so you'll know kind of exactly what's happening here in chapter 19. He's been uh, betrayed and arrested by his enemies. Uh, He's been deserted and denied by his closest friends. He's endured three religious trials. One before Annas and two before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, Israel's highest court. He's been found innocent three times. He's been tried three times. He's been found innocent three times. So unable to secure a guilty verdict of their own, he's been taken to Pontius Pilate, the governor of the Roman province of Judea. They presented him with a fabricated charge of sedition, which is rebellion against the Roman government. Pilate tried him and found him innocent. Essentially telling them this is a religious problem, it's your problem, not my problem. But upon doing so, the crowd gathered outside, became incensed. In fact, Luke says they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching all throughout Judea, from Galilee even to this place. And the claim of sedition is pressed. Now, it may be a political problem. And now it's Pilate's problem. Now, Pilate should have ended it right there. As soon as it became an apparent political issue that he had to deal with. He should have ended it right there. And at that point, he's already declared him innocent. He should have let Jesus go, but not so fast. Luke tells us about an additional detail that John left out of our text last week. It's in Luke chapter 23, verse 6. And it says, when, when Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And Pilate's ears perked up because there just so happens to be another politician in town, one with jurisdiction over the Galileans. And I don't know if you know anything about politics, but politics 101 is defer, defer, defer. So as soon as Pilate hears Galilean, he says, wait a minute. Did you say Galilean? Let me explain why this is so significant. Pilate is the governor of Judea. Galilee is another province to the north. And Pilate had a counterpart there, Herod. It just so happens that Herod is in town for the Passover. So Pilate, however the opportunist, sends him over to Herod. Herod has heard about Jesus. So he questions him. But all Herod really wants is a magic show. And when Jesus wouldn't perform like a marionette, like a puppet on a string, Herod sends him back to Pilate. Luke also tells us that a little bromance sparks between Herod and Pilate. He says Herod with his, shoulder, with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other. Isn't it amazing 
how unifying wickedness can be. I'm often amazed, though I think I'm becoming more accustomed to it in this culture that we're living in. Nevertheless, I'm still often amazed at how people of very different and opposing opinions and beliefs can suddenly be melded together by a common hatred. We've now seen it between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, here between Herod and Pilate, and I think we witness it more and more every day in our culture today. So now he's been found innocent five times. Three by the Jewish leaders, once by Pilate, and now once by Herod. The plan for his death is falling apart. They are now 0 for 5. The sun's up, and it's getting late. Both Pilate and, Pilate and Herod have dismissed the charges. And the very thing that they were hoping to avoid, a crowd and a possible riot, is beginning to happen. A crowd's forming. Jerusalem is awake. It's early dawn, and he's taken back to Pilate. Like a bad penny, he just keeps showing up, and he's in Pilate's court again. This is where John picks back up the text. So as we saw in our text last week, Pilate calls together the accusers, and he offers to release a prisoner, Jesus or Barabbas. A man accused of sedition but found innocent? Or a man convicted of sedition with dead bodies to prove it? They just want this man dead. The crowd demands release for Barabbas. So let's look at our text. John chapter 19 beginning in verse 1. Pilate knows Interesting thing you want to make sure we understand. Pilate knows at this point, as we look into chapter 1, he knows the true motive that it's been revealed. He knows they don't care about sedition against Rome. He knows they just want him dead. Verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and he flogged him. Now, Pilate's intent here, let's, again, let's make sure we understand. I don't want to be sympathetic to Pilate, but at the same time, I don't want to understand Pilate. Pilate's intent here, he's a politician and he's an opportunist. His intent here in verse 1 is to have Jesus beaten and then release him. Because he's still underestimating the hatred that they have for this man. He thinks having him beaten publicly will placate the vitriol of these people and then he can tie a bow on this thing and be move on. So John says, Pilate has Jesus flogged. The actual punishment, however, was not likely a a simple flogging. Matthew calls it a scourging. The Jews flogged. The Romans scourged. To be flogged, let's understand what the difference is. To be flogged was to be whipped with rods breaking the skin and bruising the flesh. And the purpose of it was to execute justice. That's why they limited it to 39 times, because it was believed that after that, the maximum justice had been served, and anything over that, you're just trying to humiliate the person. So they limited it at 39. That's a flogging. To be scourged was less about justice. It was more about punishment making the perpetrator an example to anyone that might be motivated to commit a similar crime. The Romans executed three levels of beatings. Depending on the crime that was convicted of, you would receive the punishment accordingly. The third and most severe form of this type of punishment, the scourging, was extremely brutal. Two soldiers called lictors, would stand on either side with whips of leather cords, a cat of nine tails. Pieces of bone or scraps of metal were tied to the end of each strand. 
And these lictors would stand on each side and they would trade strikes. As the whip came down on the flesh, it would embed itself and tear pieces of flesh from the victim's body. They whip his back. Then they flipped him and whipped his front. It was the Romans' way of flaying a man alive. So violent was a Roman scourging that many actually died while being beaten, tied on the block. So they would just take his dead body and hang him on the cross. Jesus He wasn't just beaten with rods. He was scourged. And they beat him to where he was close to death. And by this point, he looks at... In fact, the prophet Isaiah prophesied this. He said his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind... In other words, so awful was his appearance from the beatings that when the people saw him on the cross, all sympathy for him would have been dissipated by the sheer appearance that no one would have been treated that way unless their crimes truly justified it. You just don't do that to innocent people. Surely that man is guilty. People would walk by and say, what did that man do to deserve that? And give no room for his innocence. So they scourged him. Verse 2. As the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns. And put it on his head. And arrayed him in a purple robe. So after scourging him. They mocked him. In the courtyard. Right in the middle of the praetorium. But it wasn't enough to ridicule him. These are Romans. And like wind on fire, their thirst for violence is being stoked. So the soldiers gathered twigs from a thorny bush and they weaved it into a mock crown and they pressed the thorns into his flesh. Now you can imagine the blood now begins to run down his face, down his neck, and onto his body, freshly wounded by the scourging. They wanted to ridicule him and they wanted to torture him. But still it wasn't enough. They draped around him some sort of purple cloth. Probably something they dug out of the trash. And then Matthew says they put a reed in his hand. A mock scepter to scorn his claims of kingship. You see the picture? It's nasty. Verse 3. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of Jews. And struck him with their hands. Try and imagine what's happening here. They're delighting in their perverted game. And they come up to him one by one in procession. As, and as they give their mock salute, they punch him repeatedly. Christ was skinned alive and beaten senseless. And they mocked him. They mocked his power, his claim to be king, his authority to rule, and his glory. And yet, and yet, he's the perfect human. Verse 4, Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Do you hear that? That's another pronouncement of his innocence. Six times Pilate declares this man is innocent. Verse 5, so Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. There's a famous painting of that where Pilate is standing this way and Jesus comes out with his hands bound. Echo homo is the name of the uh, the painting. Jesus comes out. Pilate says, behold the man. In other words, he's nothing but a human. Look at him. 
He isn't resisting. He is, he's complying. He's no threat to Rome. He's harmless. Behold the man. Echo homo. Look at this man. Here he stands, bloody and beaten. And even still, even still, it's not enough. Verse 6, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, crucify him. Crucify him. And Pilate said, take to them, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. I think what happens next reveals the true motive of their accusations. Verse 7. The Jews answered him, we have a law. And according to that law, we, he ought to die because, look there, he was, has made himself the son of God. So there it is. That's the claim. That's their complaint. He's divine. Forget sedition. We're not, we're, we're, that, tra that train has sailed. We're not talking about sedition anymore. This man claimed to be more than a man. In fact, he claimed to be God. That's no ordinary claim. If we're honest, we dismiss people who say things like that as being mentally disturbed, don't we? Not to mention someone who's covered in blood from head to toe, their skin flayed from their body. And we should expect Pilate to do the very same thing, to dismiss Jesus as delusional, right? That's just common sense. He's already said he's not a threat, that he's harmless. But for some reason, their complaint that Jesus is the Son of God gets his attention and it disturbs him. Look at verse 8. When Pilate heard this statement, look, he was even more afraid. You wonder why, don't, don't you? You have to ask yourself, why, what was it about him? Why did he get so fearful at this point? Perhaps it was the sight of him. Perhaps it was his determined resolve to it all and his willingness to endure it. Whatever it was, it shook Pilate. Verse 9, he entered his headquarters again. Now look at this. And this is very telling. He entered his quarters, headquarters again, and he said to Jesus, Where are you from? Notice that the question has changed from who are you to where have you come from? In other words, we have stories about people like you. In Roman mythology, they have stories about demigods who came to the earth and conceived children. They called them titans. And Pilate was very aware of these stories. And this claim of divinity stops Pilate in his tracks. He's seen this man's patience, his virtue, his nobility, unlike anything else he's seen in any other man. So he asks him, are you really a man? Or are you a child of Zeus? Are you really a Nazarene? Or have you come to us from Olympus, the city of our gods? But Jesus gave him no answer. And again, Isaiah prophesied it. He said he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He has nothing to say. The reason, there is no reason to explain the time for preaching repentance is passed until the provision of repentance is given. And he'll accomplish that in everything necessary for our forgiveness in his death. Verse 10, so Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. In other words, do you want to know where I'm from? Heaven. I'm from the one true and living God. And the only reason you can stand there is because God put you there. Jesus wouldn't answer Pilate when he came where he came from, but he wasn't about to let Pilate think that he was in charge of everything. Jesus goes on, therefore, he who delivered me over to you. That's Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, just to be clear. He who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Why? Why is it that their sin is greater than Pilate's? 
sin. Why is their sin greater? Because they knew, listen, they knew about the sovereignty of God. They knew the true God. They'd heard about him all their lives. They claimed to worship him, but they were frauds. Actors in a religious drama, their guilt is greater because, listen, they knew better. Now, Pilate's not exonerated. He's not off the hook. His guilt is sincere and certain. He, like everyone who refuses to come under Christ, will carry the weight of his sin. But Pilate is blind. But as for Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, their guilt's greater because they knew better. You can't make a statement like that without, without giving a clear application. Woe, woe to the one who grows up with every opportunity, who sits in a church every Sunday from the crib on up, who hears the stories, hears the pleas, has the opportunities given and never once comes under Christ. Woe to the person because they knew better. Verse 12, from then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. In other words, you kill him (coughs) and you'll lose your career. Verse 13, so when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and he sat him on the judgment seat at a place called the stone pavement. In Aramaic, it's the Gabbatha. This is their beamet seat. It's their seat of judgment. It's here that Pilate, as governor, will pronounce his judgment. And once again, he gives it. And listen, once he gives it, it can't be undone. Think about Daniel in the lion's den. As he comes before the king, and the king pronounces his judgment. And before, as, he, as Daniel comes before the king, it, it breaks the king's heart because he loves Daniel. But there's no undoing it. It's done. As soon as Pilate makes this statement, as soon as he makes this decree from this seat, this stone pavement, there's no reversing it. It's inked into the minutes. There's no going back. Verse 14, now it was the day of the preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, 6 a.m. He said to the Jews, behold your king. And they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Now, I heard one pastor say that when you read that, you should hear in the background the sound of one beat on the timpani. We have no king but Caesar. Verse 16, so he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Now he who knows no sin bears the weight of all sin. Behold the man. Bloody, beaten. Christ, the representative of humanity, the perfect seed of Abraham, perfect human, perfect God. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. They took him to Golgotha. Golgotha. In Latin, it's Calvarius. Calvary. And it's the place outside of the city where treasonous men were tortured and put to death. It was outside the city because a condemned man who has been appointed to die is a disgrace to the Jew. And and, 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 And he would never execute death inside the city. In, the Old, in fact, in the Old Testament sacrificial system, the scapegoat on whose head the sins of the people had been placed and burned and its ashes were taken outside the city. The writer of the Hebrews addressed it. He said, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the camp in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. 
So as they force him outside the city, Luke again chimes in with a great detail that I think we often overlook. He tells us about a North African Jew who was there for the Passover. And that this North African Jew is pulled from the crowd to carry Jesus' cross. Now let's remember that the reason this is necessary isn't because Jesus is a weak man and can't carry his own cross as though he were some kind of sickly sweet preacher boy. No, it's because Jesus has been scourged and beaten. He's lost an enormous amount of blood. He hasn't slept in 24 hours. The weight of the cross beam on his debilitated body is heavier than he has strength to bear and he stumbles beneath it. So they pull a reluctant Jew from the crowd against his own will. He's reluctant because he is a pilgrim Jew and he's there for the Passover. He's gone through great lengths to maintain his purity for his visit But now, once the blood from the cross touches his body, now this man is unclean for Passover. He's touched what will be a dying man, and now he's identified with the death of that man. A man is considered unclean by his religion and useless threat to the world. To the Jew, he's a stumbling block. To the Greek, he's foolishness. To the Roman, he's a traitor. And now, Simon of Cyrene is forever part of this parody. Incidentally, Mark, who was writing his gospel to the Romans, adds another interesting detail. The names of his two sons. Of Simon the Cyrene's two sons. Alexander and Rufus. You say, what's the significance of that? Well, Christians in Rome, to whom Mark is writing, would have recognized both of those names. Many believe that Simon carried the cross to its place, that he remained there, and he watched Jesus die. And he became a believer. And was among those from Cyrene who received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and were present for the birth of the New Testament church. In fact, he strongly believed that he led his two sons to believe in Jesus. Because there's evidence of two men who became leaders in the church at Rome. Guess what their names are? Alexander and Rufus. So this man who has now lost his religious life because of Jesus' cross has found new life in it. And that is what carrying the cross of Jesus is supposed to look like. Verse 18, there they crucified him. And with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. So now this mockery of a king's court, inside of it, Jesus hangs upon a cross throne with a crown, not of precious jewels, but thorns from the very earth that he created. Thorns, which are the effect of sin upon that creation, pressed into the soft flesh very creator's own forehead. On each side of this king, two thieves, criminals. Society's rejects, condemned. And Jesus takes his place among them. Not among the popular. Not among the powerful or the upper class. Right in the midst of the lowest men in the city. And this is what we want to never forget. That for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So that in him, we might be the righteousness of God. Amen. I'm going to ask our deacons to go ahead and begin making their way to the back to serve the elements.
Tommy Nelson described the procession of Jesus to the cross, I think, in a very unique way. And he described the scene at Calvary as a parody, as a sarcasm to the one who is truly a king. And this is what he said. He said, Jesus receives a crown, but it's one of thorns. He sits on a throne, but it's the cross. He has a court, not of nobles, but of criminals. A servant will come to offer him wine, but it will not be sweet to the taste. It'll be vinegar on a sponge. In his procession, he carries his own instrument, the instrument of his execution. And his royal insignia is mocking and contempt. But behind this parody, the procession of Christ to Calvary, the place of his, per, of his crucifixion is an attitude. It's a persuasion of what the world thinks of the heavenly king. And it's a tragedy of what the creature has now done to its maker. And yet, by the time this parody is concluded, we'll see how the foolishness of God becomes wisdom to a dying thief. How the weakness of God becomes the power to save. And that in this act that men and women scorn, that this is the crucial center of the saving act of God, the fulcrum on which depends the whole plan and will of God to rescue fallen humanity. So that we never forget and that we never take his mercy for granted, God has given us a means of reminder. On the evening that he was betrayed, when he gathered with his disciples, before any of this takes place that we've just walked through, you can imagine the tone of the evening was enthusiasm. It's coming up a Passover. It's been an eventful week, but they're back together again, and things are well, and Jesus begins his discourse. And at some point in that, he says to them, this is... This bread is my body, and this cup is my life. The bread, I want you to, every time you eat it, remember that I suffered for you, that I endured hardship for you, that I endured pain for you, that they flayed my body. I didn't tell them all this because they had no way of conceiving it, but essentially we see in it that they flayed my body for you, and I, and I lived through it. I suffered. And every time you take that bread, I want you to remember I suffered for you. And this cup, every time you drink this cup, he's already told them he's going to die. He says, every time you take this cup, I want you to remember this is my life and I have forfeited it for you on your behalf so that you could be reconciled back to God. You see, that's what the Lord's Supper is to us. And I think it's intentional. In fact, I'm confident it's intentional that God did this for us because we have such an ability to forget, don't we? We have such an ability to become empathetic to other things and forget what it, who it is that God has truly blessed us and what it took to do it. And so he gave us the bread and he gave us the cup so that we don't forget. We can get distracted in a lot of things, a lot of worthwhile things. But if we get distracted from what Christ has done on the cross, we're nothing more than a social community organization with no eternal hope. But on the cross, through his suffering and his death, Jesus has given us life, eternal. This morning as we prepare to come to the table, this is something our church family does together. We do it about every other month. We'll do it again on Good Friday evening. But it's something we do on a regular basis. It's a covenant. It's a covenant. 
It's an individual thing and that we reflect on what Christ has done for me individually. And I give him thanks for that, but it's a corporate thing that we do as a covenant church. You don't have to be a member of this church to come to the table on this occasion with us. There's only one requirement, and that is that you be a believer in Christ, that you be a Christian. Now, if you're a guest with us, if you're not a member of our church, but you're a Christian, let me extend to you an invitation on behalf of this church to come be our guest with us. And when the elements come by, take the elements with us. And let's rejoice in the hope that we have in Christ. If you're not a Christian, may I respectfully ask you, when the bread and the cup comes by, just let it pass by. But don't just, don't be offended. Because here's what this does, this is intended to do. It's intended to be a testimony. And it's a testimony to you. To show you the certainty of our faith. That everything we believe and everything we have confidence in rests in this one thing, Christ and him crucified. And that's the gospel for us. It's the gospel that God has told us in his word, and it's the gospel we cling to, the good news. And we find no other hope in anything else. Full disclosure, if you're not a Christian, and you observe us today, and your intention is to do that, may I appeal to you before the cup comes by and the bread passes, trust Christ. Put your faith in him now. You don't have to attend a class. You don't have to walk down an aisle. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to go through any of these mechanisms. Those are, those are good things that, that, that allow us uh, a, a, an expression of decision. But your, your salvation is not relying on those things. You can do it right where you're seated. There's no better place than that seat you're sitting in right now to say to Jesus, I believe. I've sinned and I have, no, I have guilt before you and again, as the scripture uh, Andrew read earlier against you, you only have I sinned and I ask for your mercy and I trust Christ for it. Friend, if you'll do that, putting your faith in Christ for your salvation, the Bible says if you believe, if you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in, his, in your heart God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. May I appeal to you, beg you on, on Christ's behalf, do so today. Right now, be reconciled to him. And then when the bread comes and the cup passes, come join us as family members. Amen? Beloved Heavenly Father, we thank you. So much grief. In chapter 19. So much sorrow. The picture as it's portrayed and runs through our minds is really too much for us to bear. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for enduring it. For being the one who would for maintaining your purity so that you, when you did, you would be a perfect sacrifice for our guilt. I don't understand all of your wisdom, but I know you are good and right and merciful and gracious. And that you have given us Christ. And we thank you. Now, Lord, as we take these elements, I pray that our hearts would be laid bare before you. That you would forgive us for our sin. That you would restore the joy of your salvation within us. And that while the elements represent a grievous thing they are for us hope and peace and joy
And I pray the Holy Spirit would do the work of rescuing those who are lost, even now in this moment. Drawing us all to know you and to trust you. And I pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Thank you for listening to this resource provided by Westwood Baptist Church. While we are so glad you were able to listen, we encourage you not to allow this to take the place of you attending a local church. If you would like more info on Westwood, follow us on social media at Westwood Life or visit us online at westwoodlife.org.